Hi, welcome to First Things First. I'm Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado. And today we've got a very special episode. As you can see, I'm here live with Scott Felsenthal. Scott is the CEO of Whitmore. And we're live at their beautiful facility here in uh, Tennessee. So, um, Scott, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop a note. And we'll try to get as many questions as we can answer, particularly from Scott. So just pop them into the uh, bottom of the screen and I'll, I'll field them as we go. So maybe we could do, if you don't mind, Scott, um, let's get started by, if you wouldn't mind sharing for the audience your story, either personally or your, your company, the foundations, you've got a really rich heritage and I'd love for them to hear kind of how you all got started and what you're doing today. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Rob. And thanks for being here. Uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, so Whitmore, we're a fourth generation family owned business, started in 19, 1946. <laughs> oh, and this is my uncle, Sandy. third oh, wow. generation. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Hi, I'm Sandy. We're, we're, we're live, so say hi to the audience. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I gotta go take Lenny there. Crazy things happen in a family business. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Um, so 1946, company started up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my great grandfather, who was on the wall behind me, can't see him, and then my grandfather is on another wall here. But uh, company started up there in 1946, um, and eventually migrated down to to Arkansas, where we became a manufacturer of, of home storage products uh, from 1946 all the way through the uh, really late 1990s. Um, and we became an importer very quickly in the late 1990s, like everyone had to do. Um, I believe the statistic is 1996. We were 100% manufacturing, and by 1997, we were 90% importers. So wow. Happened very quickly, uh, but uh, uh, so we became an importer, began to build significant relationships with factories that we still have today, uh, mostly in Asia. Um, and uh, 2008, our uh, facility, manufacturing facility, uh, turned into a distribution facility in, in Arkansas, but in 2008, uh, a tornado came through, knocked down a third of the facility, uh, fortunately, no one was hurt, but it allowed us the opportunity to, to move to where we are today, which is just south of, of Memphis and South Haven, Mississippi, uh, where we have a, a 500,000 square foot uh, warehouse and uh, our office staff all in one. So, Scott, I'm kind of curious. I just want to riff off that a little bit. So you essentially grew up in this business and now you've risen all the way up to running the business. So can you tell us about your personal journey? That must have been yeah. fascinating because you've watched it from ground high basically right? yeah so all, all of our family in the business and i'll talk about that in a second well you just met uh, his uncle yeah just met my <laughs> uncle who, who came on uh, waved his arms on the screen um uh but we all feel like we grew up in the business i can remember when i was uh, eight nine ten years old being at my grandfather's house with sears buyers and all these merchants there and our sales team in town and i kind of just grew up learning the business that way um but we all kind of feel that way so my 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 uncle Sandy, who just popped on, he's the last member of the third generation in the business. My father uh, was in the business for 39 years and retired a couple of years ago. Um, and then I had an uncle in the business. Uh, he retired about six years ago. Sandy has two kids in the business. Um, uh, one is handling uh, our Amazon account and the other one is more on the operational side of things. So we've got, uh, you know, fortunately it works very well for us. There's a lot of stories out there. Of, Family business has gone wrong, but uh, we're very blessed to have good family dynamics, and it's been a big part of our success. Fantastic! Thanks for sharing that. So, I want to transition a little bit. So, you sell. If we could, if you could see this facility, it's great because they've got a big distribution center attached to this, and a, a big board full of brand names. You sell to some of the biggest brand names in the country. So, um, I guess the question is, how do you accommodate both the complexity and the scale of selling to people like Amazon and the Target. So maybe just transition a little bit into supply chain. How do you how do you think about that as you're bringing on those big brands and supporting them? Yeah, I think uh, number one thing for us is just operational excellence. So whether we're shipping Amazon, Walmart, Target, um, whoever it may be, at the end of the day, you're shipping cartons of products on a pallet to a retailer out of your distribution facility. So uh, it's kind of like, um, what is it, Hoosiers, the, the basketball movie where they're kind of trained to think, you know, the stadiums are always going to look different, but the court is the same. Yeah, they And do. not to say the customers are the same, but if you have the foundational aspect of operations down to a pretty good um, science, like our team, 
you know, like we like to think we have, we're not perfect, but, um, and certainly the last couple of years have definitely taught us we're not perfect. Um, but if you, if you have that kind of operational excellence built into what you do, uh, you're really just slightly changing the, uh, your actions based on the requirements of those retailers, how you ship things, um, how you route things, how you, uh, confirm orders, et cetera. So if you got the core piece down, which in our, in our world is, is our operations, um, then the rest are just small little pivots that you learn to deal with. So do you see any changes in the supply chain in, in terms of you've been selling to the big box retailers, I know for a long time, has their business changed? Have you had to change your business to accommodate the way that they're now selling to their customers? Yeah, uh, they, they change a lot. Um, whether it was around the Trump tariff times when retailers were trying to get creative in terms of how they brought products in to avoid some of that stuff. Uh, there were some changes there that we had to, be flexible with them to, to comply with or uh, just normal course of business things. I mean, everyone, whether it's the supplier like us or the retailer, you're always looking to be as efficient as possible and streamline your operations. So um, not only are we constantly striving to do that, but every single retailer we work with strives to do that as well. So there's changes along the way sometimes. So I have to ask, because you give me the opportunity, you said, well, we thought we were excellent until the last couple of years. <laughs> How was the pandemic? How did you how did you think about that? Because, you know, I, I watched the whole world tip off its access. Essentially, I can't imagine what it was like for you as a business, both with suppliers overseas and customers, big customers here. What did that look like for you? What was the pandemic time for you? Maybe the two years that it was kind of in full force. Yeah, I remember. Um, and it's probably a similar story for, for most most big uh, distribution companies. But I remember March 2020, um, one day being in the office or I was actually probably at home given it was after COVID started, uh, learning of the amount of retailer POs that got canceled in a given week. And, yeah. you know, all of us and the rest of the world was like, what's going on? It was scary as, as hell. Um, and in the weeks to follow, people kind of figured it out and orders kind of picked back up. But the, the, what we learned over the two, three year period is initially with COVID, it was the Chinese suppliers that were really, right. uh, really being, you know, choked, if you will. They had they so much down. product. They were shutting down. That um, too much. The demand in the U.S. was crazy. Uh, they couldn't produce product quick enough. Uh, but not only could they not produce it, then you had the whole container issue where if you could even get containers, were you going to pay the crazy prices mm -hmm. that required to, to import? So our experience was we had a lot of... Um, Asian suppliers that were having to hold product for us on their factory floors. And, you know, that's not something that's, uh, uh, it's not, that's not the best plan for anybody, but it was the, it was the nature of the game at the time. And factories had 15, 20, 25 containers worth of product sitting on factory floors until we can move it. So long story short, at the beginning of COVID, we were having to really help our suppliers, um, whether it was prepaying for some goods that, that was just sitting there and they weren't getting paid for. Uh, or whatever. Um, but now on the backside of COVID, when importers and distributors like us have been glutted with so much inventory from containers sitting in China and finally sailing this year uh, at reasonable prices, um, now it's kind of, hey, suppliers help us through this period because clearly with all this inventory hitting at once, it's very hard to to pay all your suppliers uh, like you normally would in the course of business. So it's been a it's been a full circle journey where we have helped the suppliers, suppliers are helping us. And really that's at the heart of our company is relationships and uh, the importance of relationships, especially in times like these. Well, so speaking of relationships, how was it on the other side? So you're talking about the, the, the sort of topsy-turvy with the suppliers. How about with your customers? Were they supportive of you during that period of time or were they even more demanding because everybody was in the same boat. So just kind of wondering how you kept all your customers reasonably satisfied during that time. Good question. Most for a majority of the COVID period, most customers were understanding because they were, you know, it wasn't a, just a story from Whitmore. It was a story yeah. from everyone. <laughs> but uh, there were certainly a couple of retailers, one of which uh, I won't name, but many <laughs> might be able to guess on this, uh, on this call. Um, we're not understanding and, and, you know, put threats out there and it ends up there. One of the retailers that you know might not be here much longer, but um, uh, yes, there was a lot of partnership through COVID uh, at every single level because it was truly one of those events where we were all in this together. 
suppliers, retailers, factories, distributors, importers, freight forwarders. I mean, it was a it was a collective journey that was painful, but we all knew we had to do it together or else there was no end. So the last piece of that triangle, how about for your team here? You know, you, you're you not here, but you've got a beautiful facility here, really great environment, but all of your workers suddenly weren't here. So how did you manage that challenge? Because everybody was dispersed. It was a very difficult time. How did you keep the team sort of focused and on board during that period? Yeah, it's, uh, it was an operational challenge because we have a warehouse to run. You can't do that remote. Not true, um, yeah. And our warehouse team managers, supervisor, I mean, they were incredible. We never missed a, we never missed a beat. Um, we went through the, the staggering of office staff, but the warehouse staff was a constant solid uh, group of people and they just worked through it. And they, uh, thank God, we never had to, to really shut down the company for COVID. We had a couple you know, departmental issues from here time to time, but um, it was really a, a team effort and our warehouse teams were incredible. Fantastic. Well, so on to a uh, happier subject. I guess. <laughs> I'm glad we got through that. Knock on wood, well, we're past that. Um, I was kind of curious, since you mentioned all of these complexities, so you're having to communicate with your internal employees, with your suppliers overseas, with your retailers. So what role does technology play in your supply chain? How do you keep all that in? It's tons of information, right? Tons of SKUs, tons of different requirements. How do you keep all of that together from a technology standpoint? What does that look like for y'all? Yeah, technology has become a bigger piece of our business year after year. And obviously with the, the implementation from years ago, Mercado, that plays a big piece in our supply chain efforts. Um, on the freight forwarder side, we use a freight forwarder that's very you know technology savvy. Um, so there's bits and pieces of technology that brought together in ways that are that our IT, IT and kind of our business intelligence people can bring data together. It, it's been really powerful. It's not perfect um, because sometimes the data that you're getting from all these systems is not perfect, but um, that's that'll be a continued challenge of, of how to how can technology be perfect? And it's you know it's about the data, making sure the data is perfect. But technology is going to continue playing a, a bigger, bigger role for us as well as many that import. Well, and just maybe one not so technical question, but you have your in-house IT team managing your your WMS or your ERP, your system of record. And then you mentioned you've got applications of data coming in from different sources. So it's it, here's command and control. So they're basically looking for the data in and out mm -hmm. and you're receiving it from other people, normalizing it, using it for the purpose. So that's kind of how that's right. That, that's kind of that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I want to I want to go a completely different direction if I could, especially since I'm looking at your great grandfather and your grandfather. I wish y'all could see him here. It's it's great and and his uncle, but I'm kind of curious. Where do you see this business ten years from now? Can you think that far in advance, or is it is it too tough to predict where you think Whitmore will head? Because you're now the next person taking this thing forward, and they're all counting on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's a great question, and I. I think my answer before the last couple of years is probably different than it is today. And I think the answer today is we want to be a company that provides great workplace for our employees that demonstrates consistent, steady growth, but we don't have to be the biggest, you know, and uh, I, I want us to be as healthy a company as we can, even if that means we're not going to be as big as we potentially could be. Okay. Um, so I think the last few years has made, you know, certainly has made us sit back and think about who do we want to be when we grow up. And it's, you know, I want to be that company that's here for many, many more generations, uh, providing great jobs to great people, as opposed to we have got to be X amount of revenue and so and so years, you know, we just, the numbers will take care of itself. But I think first and foremost, what the last several years the business has taught us is that financial health is everything and we need to focus not that we, we've always been a healthy company but we got to focus hard on making sure we're making the right decisions that might sacrifice some growth but continue to allow us to be the healthy company we want to be yeah so that's great and i sort of i was thinking about the direction from from two sides we're seeing a lot of changes uh, everybody's sort of omnichannel so people are selling in more and varied ways than they ever have before. And you took me in a direction I didn't expect, but it's the right one, which is focus on great products. Do you see that changing? You see yourself becoming, um, moving into different sales channels? You, I know you're primarily selling to retailers now. Do you see yeah. other sales channels available to you that you're gonna pursue? Or is it mostly just focus around great product design and continue to sell more to the people 
that you're close to and that you do business with and, and pursuing that channel? Yep, good question. Uh, our focus as a company has been always been uh, being the best partners to our retailers that we can be. For instance, we don't sell product from our website to the consumer. Why? Because we feel like that competes with our right, retailers. Sure. Um, we, we're not a company that, you know, five years ago got into the direct to consumer business. Um, it's just a decision we made at the time to really stay focused on our retail partners. And I think the pendulum has swung. I mean, it swung very far to, you got to, you know, ship direct to consumer. You got to drop ship. You got to do all these things. And we do do a little of that, but I think the pendulum has swung back where brick and mortar retail, it's, it's not going away. It's right. going to evolve. Right. Um, and we want to make sure that our relationships with our retailers are as strong as they can be so that we can evolve that process with them. We want to we want to be a company that continues to evolve with our retailers and not lose sight of that by going off into different tangents that could potentially compete with them. So we really focus on the retailers. We believe in, in retail. We believe in brick and mortar retail. Um, and that's just that's been our focus. Well, I think statistically it backs you up, right? We saw the big spike in e-commerce because of the pandemic, but most of that has shifted back mm -hmm. to the stores, mm -hmm. right? Good old stores. So when you think about product design, I'm just curious, how do you stay on top of what's the latest in the organization category and how do you stay a leader in that? How do you all work on products and product design at Whitmore? We have we have an internal product development team designers, uh, but if you think about it, with the amount of retailers that we sell product to, we're constantly getting data from those retailers. We're getting you know, POS data. We're getting um, you know feedback and ideas from the merchants themselves. So we've got all these funnels of product ideas coming into our teams, and that's really kind of how we know the price points we have to hit. We know our supplier. Uh, capacities and restraints and creative uh, creativity, if you will. Um, so we have all the the tools, and then we've got the data flowing in. So we use that data, we use the tools, we use the great minds of our product development team, and we just constantly try to innovate because at the end of the day, you know, you really don't want to be just another commodity business. You want to provide value to to your customers and our retail partners, and so it's a big focus for us. Any trends you're seeing in your industry? Anything changing? I know it was. It's been a hot category. Yeah, it's home. We're very lucky, thankful to be in the the home category. Um, historically, in recessionary times, our business does very well. Uh, the pandemic time obviously was a very good time for for businesses like ours. Um, there's less companies in our industry today for obvious reasons. We've had some some pretty significant competitors go out of business the last couple of years. Um, so it's uh, there's opportunities for us, but we have to be very careful what we go after for the reason we spoke before. We want to we don't want to just go after growth for the sake of going after growth. We want to be very, very smart about it. And that's kind of where our uh, mentality has changed in, uh, over the last couple of years. So that's a solid plan. I'm going to ask you the flip side, though. What keeps you awake at night? If Gosh, um, maybe nothing. You know, I try to block out a lot of the, the noise out there. I, I've always been someone that kind of thinks uh, contrarian. So I don't, if the, if the mass media is thinking one thing, I'm usually thinking the other, uh, not that I'm always right, but I just, uh, so I, so I try not to, I try not to let the noise get to me, but there's, you know, I, freight rates have come down so much that you almost wonder is, you know, what, is this really real? Um, I think there's something out there that no one's thinking about that could potentially throw things off. Yeah. Whether it's this whole diesel shortage issue that's being talked about or, or other things, I I don't know. I just uh, everyone says uh, rates are down so much, which they are. But I think everyone just feels like we're back to where we were. And I, I don't think so. Um, yeah. It's pendulum swung maybe too far in either direction. So is there something yeah, that's coming? Yeah. I don't know. Um, so we always try to run our company in a way that we're prepared, prepared for the worst, but prepared for the best and somewhere in the middle is where things shake out. Oh, that's a great answer. And then I guess you know, one of the things I was thinking you might answer or what keeps you awake at night as well, or that I think about is I, I've been doing this a long time and I, it's an interesting time from a sourcing perspective. So for a long time, you know, we sort of rode the China wave mm -hmm. and now there's a lot of talk about sourcing shifts. How do you think about that? Does that keep you awake at night or are you well positioned, um, you know, with, suppliers in multiple countries and so forth that you can manage that 
Yeah, we do, we do have, we've diversified our manufacturing um, quite a bit over the last few years. Obviously many like us and us included are still pretty heavy in Asia and China. So if I lose sleep over anything, it's, uh, it's certainly um, what that could look like in years to come. You know, a lot of, a lot of political stuff, a lot of conversation about uh, China and relations with the United States. Um, so it's, it's the, what gives you some comfort is we're not, so many companies are in the same boat. I mean, yeah, we've, yeah. we've diversified our, our sourcing channels significantly in the last couple of years, but China is always, I mean, they're just superior in many ways with infrastructure and manufacturing cost. that you really can't cost. You really yeah. just, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to take a lot away from that. Um, so we'll see what evolves, but that's, uh, that's a big piece of the future. Okay. So I've got about, We've got about eight minutes left. I'd like to shift if I could. One of the things that's always impressed me about you, Scott, is the, well, at least I see from the outside is the culture here. I read your posts on LinkedIn. I've met, you know, many members of your team and I'm always impressed by how, at least from the outside, how cohesive this place seems and how positive it seems. How do you think about culture? How do you keep this team environment going and, and think about the future at the same time? Yeah, we, we are a family business, but a lot of companies, well, not a lot of companies, but some companies I know will, that are family business. It's one thing to say you are. It's another thing to, to act like you are. Yeah. So we take it very seriously to not just say we're a family business, operated business, but that everyone here is family. You know, people aren't a number. They're real people yeah. with real families and real problems of their own and real strengths that they all have and kind of bring to us. And we, we try to make sure that uh, we give people flexibility and empowerment to, to do their jobs. And, um, it's a tough environment. I mean, this is, this, this type of industry is not for everybody, <laughs> especially the last couple of years, but it's, it's not a, it's not an industry where you, you come in and you've got a list from A to Z and you're going to go down your list every day. It's, you know, you might be on, uh, point number one and then you get to point number two and then you're, at the last thing on here, I mean, there's just so much that comes up in a given day with retail on the supply side that you've got to be so flexible and employees that embrace that really, uh, I mean, we have employees that have been with us 55 plus years, um, really handful of 40 plus 30 wow. plus. Wow. It is really people from every generation. Almost like family. Yeah, it is. Um, we have an employee that has worked for. We have employees that worked here who are older my, than. For my for the first generation of the business, <laughs> second generation, third, and wow. now and now fourth. And it's uh, she is That's here terrible. every day, and she is unbelievable. And it, um, you know, we're just we're just if you're authentic and genuine with your employees, um, even if the truth sometimes isn't what they want to hear, I think that carries a lot of weight. And we try to be as, as authentic and um, as we can be. And I think I think that's part of the, the key. So playing off that a little bit, how do you either, we have a lot of young uh, people tuning in. So either one of two things, or maybe both. How do you think about bringing people into your organization? What are the key attributes that you look for? And or what kind of advice would you give for people looking to enter into business? We've got college students and others. And I'm just kind of curious, how do you think about the advice that you give to people or who you're attracted to when you're mm -hmm. interviewing people, what, what kind of skill sets do you look for? Or what advice do you give people to get prepared for this type of an environment? Yeah, it's, it's been, a, it's been a challenging two, three years because uh, what's different about the last couple of years as the previous years in terms of hiring is it's been such an employee driven market, meaning um, there's, there's been, oh, right. it's been very competitive. So the interviewing process and what you, your ideal candidate, your mindset oh, has had to shift a little bit. That. Yeah, it's uh, so it hasn't been a perfect world for hiring, but you certainly want um, for us. It's people that that understand urgency, that that don't have to have structure, um, that can be you know team driven, and you know all the stuff you want in an employee, but people that you can just really see buy into the flexibility required in a business like ours. Um, and it's hard to describe. You just kind of see and feel it when you when you talk to the right people. A lot of employee referrals. Yes, we yeah. we we do push that um, because that's that's kind of part of the family concept. So if you've got great friends or people that you think would be here, let's 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 do it together. Yeah, let's bring them in. Yeah. And um, so, just final question is an open question. 
anything else that I didn't cover that you want to share, uh, whether it's about Whitmore or the supply chain business or technology or anything that I didn't cover? Any, any final thoughts before we close out here? One thing, yeah, one thing uh, someone told me a few months ago, and this was so true, is that supply chain used to be a department and now supply <laughs> chain is a company. Uh, I mean, it, it is it is something I think about often and that is very reflective here. It's not our supply chain team that's the only one making decisions anymore. It is so many people involved in supply chain related conversations here. Um, so the fact that supply chain, you know, certainly is a department with unbelievable people, but so much of that decision making process has to be more holistic at the company level to be able to navigate what has been a crazy couple of years. So it's it's been interesting to see how supply chain, you know, terminology and things that only our supply chain team would know a couple of years ago is like understood by the company. Okay, so that question wasn't planned, but I have to tell you, I've got an ear to ear grin because I grew up in this business and to his point, nobody knew what we even did for a long time. And now he's saying it's a company. I saw a meme uh, recently, uh, I guess it was about six months ago, but it was a, a girl saying, I couldn't get a date for six months, supply chain issues. <laughs> so it's not only become a company, it's become a thing. And everybody knows what the supply chain is. So for me, I've kind of come full circle yeah. going into a business I knew nothing about to now becoming yeah. uh, Toronto Center thing. So that's that's a great way to uh, end the show. So um, thank you all to the audience. I see we've got some questions. Sorry we didn't get a chance to get to those. But um, we'll respond to those. We've got them in our chart. We'll respond to each of you individually uh, after the podcast. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Scott, thank you very much Thanks, for Rob. joining us. Thanks. I really enjoyed this time. Thanks. And uh, we'll talk to you all next month. Cheers.